Welcome to worship at Zion today. Uh, happy fourth Sunday of Epiphany, or better known as Happy Super Bowl Day. Uh, nothing says Super Bowl like too much food to eat, and so consequently three of my announcements have to do with eating food. Um, first of all, our youth who are attending next summer's national youth gathering, hard to believe it is so close, uh, but um, they are serving some fantastic cinnamon rolls today during the fellowship time, so please join them. Uh, any donations you give towards that will help them on their way to Detroit, and uh, we appreciate the, their serving us today. Also, uh, today is the Super Bowl brunch or breakfast ad that the Lions are serving, and they are serving from 8 until 1 o'clock, so you can have a cinnamon roll here and still get down there for lunch. And uh, uh, until 1 o'clock, and the proceeds for the Lions uh, Super Bowl breakfast today goes toward new play ground at Greenfield Elementary. So that is a great thing that they're doing for our community. And our final eating announcement has to do with the Valentine's Sweetheart Dinner. Uh, we are doing that, it's kind of a, a new idea. And so we thought, well, let's give it a shot. And it is looking to be a lot of fun. And so we hope that you will all sign up. All you need to do to sign up is call the church office. Jill can help you and, uh, and you just show up and you enjoy a great, great feast that will be prepared for you. And that is on Saturday, February 14th. So Valentine's Day dinner out. Um, we receive a greater feast yet today as we receive Holy Communion. Jesus has promised that this love feast, as uh, some of the early Christians called it, this love feast is a gift for our souls. And uh, it is the gift of forgiveness and new life. This week we said goodbye to a dear friend of ours, Grace Albrecht, and we trust that she is living the new life now and uh, feasting in the presence of God. We, um, we continue our worship at this time. Uh, let's see, oh John, Turkelson has an announcement. This is also for Chaplain Sunday. Thank you, Pastor. We talked earlier, it seemed like it's only been about three months since I've done this, but it's actually 12. The first Sunday in February is designated as for Chaplains Sunday. The American Legion is encouraged to remember and honor these men and spread the story of brotherhood as their heroic sacrifice as a symbol of brotherhood. To strengthen unity in one's relationship with God and humanity. On February 3, 1943, the Army transport ship Dorchester was torpedoed by a German U-boat while crossing the icy North Atlantic in a convoy. Of the 902 soldiers, merchant seamen, and civilian workers aboard, only 230 were rescued. The fact that even that many survived is a part, is in part because of the level heads and steady hands of lieutenants George Fox, Alexander Good, Clark Poling, and John Washington. As Dorchester slid beneath the waves, <clears throat> the four army chaplains calmed frightened men and led as many as they could to safety. When they ran out of life jackets, they gave away their own. And those swimming in the water and floating in the rafts never forgot their last glimpse of the chaplains, all four. A Methodist minister, Jewish rabbi, a Reformed Church in America reverend, and Roman Catholic priest. They were all linked in arm in arm, praying and singing hymns as they went down with the ship. In a way, they achieved immortality, the nation, for a nation at war, the chaplain's triumph in the face of tragedy became an enduring example of faith, courage, selflessness, and sacrificial love. 
May we remain faithful to the spirit of the four chaplains who having learned to live and serve together in death were not divided. Their courage must never be forgotten. Now I have some copies of the complete story. If anybody's interested, just contact me and it's, it's rather interesting. These men were down in the lower with orders to keep their uniforms on and wear their life jackets, but the heat of the engines made them think, ah, oh, it's too hot. So they took them off and then this is what happened when the, when the thing got hit. So, thank you. Thank you, John. We continue our worship as we sing hymn number 665. Would you please stand as we sing, Rise, Shine, You People. front portion of our hymnal on page 94 we confess our sins and we receive the Lord's forgiveness we are gathered in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit amen, amen. God of all mercy and consolation come to the help of your people turning us from our sin to live for you alone give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. <coughs> Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. 
As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our prayer of the day is printed in our worship folder. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> the first reading for this Sunday is recorded in the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy, beginning with the 15th verse. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your own people. You must listen to him, for this is what you ask the Lord your God at Horb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor seek his great fire any more, or we will die. The Lord said to me, What they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their people, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, is to be put to death. Please rise for the reading of the Gospel. <clears throat> the Gospel reading for this morning is recorded in the first chapter of Mark, beginning with the 21st verse. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? a new teaching, and with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits, and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you, Keith. And thanks be to God that we do have the opportunity to pray. And that's what this song is kind of all about. And uh, it's a song that came out of the Korean War as an invocation for civilian support through the power or weapon of prayer. It was written by the Leuven brothers, anybody that followed country music back in the 40s and 50s. And Charlie Leuven was a serviceman in Korea. And and he wrote this song, and it stands so true to today with all the, the problems, not only across the water, but right here at home. <clears throat> In that land across the sea, there's a job for you and me. Though our presence there may not be found, we must stay each night and day on the battle line and pray. We must never let our weapons down. We don't have to be a soldier in a uniform to be a 
of service over there. While the boys so bravely stand with the weapons made by hand, let us trust and use the weapon of prayer. Many thousand miles away, someone shed their blood today. With the heart so true and brave, they've gone to a war that's yours and mine. Let us join the battle line with the weapon that will save our home. When the planes and tanks and guns have done all <clears throat> that they could do, and the mighty bombs have rained and fell, still the helpful hand above holds a weapon made of love, and against him none on earth prevail. We don't have to be a soldier in a uniform To be of service over there While the boys so bravely stand With the weapons made by hand Let us trust and use the weapon of prayer while the boys so bravely stand With the weapons made by hand Let us trust and use the weapon of prayer Thank you, John. Well, let's pick up that weapon and start praying. Thank you, God, for welcoming us into your presence and uh, for bringing us together in this place that we can hear your word and we can seek ways to live for you today and through this coming week. We pray that you would strengthen us and that in our fellowship we would find strength uh, in that life of faith. Guide us always, bring us together, that we might hear your word and that we might live according to it. In your life-giving name we pray, Jesus. Amen. I remember in younger days uh, receiving a chain letter. You know what that is? A chain letter. Um, and to be honest with you, it rather scared me. I read it and I thought, oh no, what do I do? Today the same thing happens, I know, with emails and probably other ways electronically that I have no clue about. But what the gist of it is that if you pass this letter or this message along to, say, 10 other people, you will receive a great reward. Something wonderful will happen in your life and it's probably a boatload of money. Wow. Sometimes. Uh, but if you don't do this, something terrible, terrible is going to happen to someone you love. Now this is sometimes followed by examples of people who did what they were told and then maybe they won the lottery or maybe they got an anonymous gift of a million dollars and your heart starts to pump and you think wow what could I do with a million dollars what could be better than a million dollars a billion dollars so what do you do well further examples are given of people who broke the chain you can almost hear the thunder roll and you can almost feel the earthquakes begin. You broke the chain. 
and someone must pay for your neglect if that, as the letter proclaims, you are to blame. And so your heart pumps even faster. And you just can't bear to carry the blame for this unknown tragedy. What do you do? Well, you take a chance. And so when you're young, <clears throat> you pass the note along. You send it to 10 other people. You don't send it to 11 because it says send it to 10. You do exactly what you're told. And you're a little bit afraid. But then nothing happens. At least not that you can see. There's no money coming your way. But then you comfort yourself with the thought that perhaps someone after you received the gain and they maybe needed it more than you did. Or... You toss the note in the garbage or you delete that message from your email or text and then you grit your teeth hoping that nothing is horrible happens. Or you question the authority of that whole thing and you wonder who is it that actually determines the outcome of all of this good or bad stuff? Who actually decides what's going to happen? Is God the one controlling this letter? Is someone else controlling the outcome of this letter? Or something else? Something cosmic? Something you don't even understand? Whose voice do you hear? Are you going to listen to the voice of fear? Are you going to listen to the voice of greed? Or maybe it's guilt that motivates you. Today's Bible readings speak about that voice that is almost too terrible to hear. Now it seems to me a very strange thing that happens in today's Bible reading from Deuteronomy. As I was reading through this earlier this week, I didn't even catch this the first couple of times I read it. It just seems so strange to me that I just read past it looking for something else. But the people pleaded that they would not have to listen to the voice of God anymore. Isn't that amazing? They begged to not hear the voice of of God anymore. Deuteronomy 18 verse 16 says it exactly this way. Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire anymore, or we will die. So what's up with that? Why would these Israelites not want to hear God's voice anymore? As I look at this story of the Exodus, it seems to me at least that this voice of God was almost too much to take in. It's kind of like a powerful word that just knocks the wind out of your sails. It is such a powerful word that it, they're afraid it was going to knock the life out of their bodies. Amazingly holy. That's what this word was. Too holy for their sinful hearts and minds to carry. But even though God is a God of power and might, God is also a God of love. So God didn't just shrug off this human frailty and beat them into the dust with his word. God actually listened to the cry of his people who said, God, don't talk to me anymore. God actually listened to them. But God did not stop speaking just to honor this insane request. God said that he would 
speak through the voice, through a human voice, a, hopefully a more palatable way. People are used to hearing people talk. So God said, now I will speak to you through people. And so here enters the first prophet, a regular human voice. God actually steps back from the mind-blowingly amazing way of his divine holiness to come to his beloved children in a human form. First, through the prophets, and then, finally, through the Christ. There's a problem, though, with the human voice. We all know that with one and the same voice can come truth or falsehood. With one and the same voice can come either wisdom or ignorance. And so we are warned about the difference between the prophet of God and the false prophet in Deuteronomy 18.20. And it's interesting to me, too, that God knew this was going to happen. As God was speaking, he made a plan to address the possibility of truth or falsehood coming from people's mouths. God gave up his own power to put it into those lips. <laughs> so how can we tell the difference? In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus talks about how do we discern the words of a prophet, whether those words are true or false. The true prophet is known by the fruit of the message, he says. In other words, does the message of those words lead people to God or does it draw them toward the speaker? If the message leads to fear, the scripture tells us very clearly that that is not a message from God. And so here enters the old chain letter again. I think that's a good example of this. Some of those chain letters even claim to be from religious sources, maybe from the voice of God himself. But the fear that drives those letters, the negative power of that word drives people inward. Not, not to seek God, but, but the, the angst that those things create drives people inward and the fear takes away the thought of faith and it turns towards self-reliance. The question comes up, what if I do this? What if I don't do that? It drives, fear always drives us inward. Kind of to self-protect. Never, never opens up the heart to what is to come. Remember that in all times of fear, God is still God. No matter what the letter says, <laughs> no matter what somebody else says, God is still God, no matter what happens in this life. And God is love, we are told in his word, and perfect love casts aside all fear. Perfect love casts aside every single fear. 1 John chapter 4 says that. So read 1 John, not the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, but way towards the end of the New Testament, 1 John chapter 4. Read that sometime fairly soon. The message of Jesus is a message that leads to life. The message of Jesus is a message that leads to new life and it is never motivated by fear. Today's Old Testament reading talks about prophecy, but more than just answering the question of what is a prophet, it talks about the possibility of true prophecy or false. What is the authority of that word that is spoken? Likewise, in today's reading from Mark chapter 1, we find the question of authority. When Jesus was speaking to the people, 
There were some who questioned if this ordinary person could possibly speak the truth. What is his authority? They asked of Jesus. As Jesus speaks to us, I believe we need, each one of us, needs to evaluate in our own hearts whether or not Jesus' word is a word of authority for our own lives. Does the word of Christ inform and actually affect how we live our lives? That's the question of authority for each one of us. Jesus tells us that his word is authoritative because he comes from God. And he speaks the things that God tells him to speak. In John 7, 16, Jesus says, the teaching that I give is not my own. Jesus was not saying what he wanted to say. He even asked if that cup could be taken away from him. John chapter 7, verse 16, the teaching that I give is not my own, it is the teaching of him who sent me. Rather like the task of the prophet, but Jesus clearly is not merely prophetic. Jesus is God. And Jesus is God in human flesh. Remember the terror of the people as we read Today in Deuteronomy, they begged to be spared from the power of God's word. And so God chose to respect that fear. Instead, God sent his word in human form. And so it's no coincidence that Jesus is called the word of God made flesh. Jesus is the word of God. God speaks to us through Jesus. How greatly in awe are we when we hear the reading of God's word. When you hear the reading of God's word, does it just about knock the wind out of your sails? Are you afraid that the power of that word is going to destroy you? When you hear the reading of God's word, does it stun you with awe? that you can hardly do anything else but think about those words? Does the Bible awe us when we open its cover? Far too often we know the pages of many Bibles never see the light of day. Why is that? Are we begging God to be silent like the Israelites did? A challenge today, and I have offered this challenge many, many times. And if I live another day, I may offer that challenge again. <laughs> that we actually read God's word and then find the truth therein. Open the word. Read it slowly. Read it thoughtfully. Pray that God's word is going to find a place in your heart. It might be a different place in your heart than it is in somebody else's. But you talk to God about that. And seek the path that God directs for you. Remember your homework assignment? 1 John chapter 4. Uh, really, I, I think that's an amazing place to start. If you haven't read God's word in a little while, that is a good place to start. Now, one final thought from Mark chapter 1, verse 28. This is about the authority of God's word. We are told that God's word is effective. It always does what it says. It always draws others toward God. We are told that news about Jesus spread throughout the region of Galilee. That's kind of where he lived. It is our prayer and our mission 
that the good news of Jesus Christ will spread throughout the whole region of Woodville and Baldwin and wherever we might live. It is our intention to be deliberate, to find that this word is true every minute of every day. We find that God's word challenges our world big time. And as we saw in Mark chapter 1, that there were many, many people who were in positions of power in Jesus' day, they questioned his word. What authority do you have, Jesus? They may never have seen it. We believe that God's word is true. And as we are challenged, when we trust him, we find blessings that we may not have expected. Now, if you have not read the Bible this week, do yourself a favor and seek God's voice. Seek God's voice. And don't beg like the Israelites to not hear it, but eagerly welcome God's word and gladly hear and learn it. Amen. This next song is a prayer about that, I think. Lord, let my heart be good soil, hymn number 512. confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would our ushers please wait upon us at this time as we share our offerings.
We thank you, gracious God, for the gifts that you have first given to us. As we return them to you, may they serve you and serve the people in our world. We give our lives through this offering. You have given your life through this Holy Communion. And so we celebrate that new life in uh, this moment now. In your name we pray, amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took the bread. He broke it, he gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We pray our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we receive Holy Communion today, um, all who come here in the name of Jesus Christ are welcome to receive this gift. Jesus has given his life to us all for the forgiveness of our sins. If you prefer a gluten-free wafer, it's in the glass dish on the center of the table. If you hold that up, uh, take your own wafer and hold it up for the blessing as we receive the bread. As we receive the wine, if you abstain from alcohol, the center ring of each tray is prepared for you. And uh, songs that may be sung during Holy Communion are listed in the bulletin. Holy Communion is prepared.
is the body of Christ for you. We continue as we pray. Gracious Lord, you have called us.
to your side, to your service, and to your salvation. May we live always for you. And as you lead us, we will live always for one another. Help us to receive your forgiveness. As we have sinned against you and as we have sinned against one another, we trust that your mercy and your grace is greater than all. And so in our gratitude, we place our lives before you, that we would hear your voice and that we would follow your calling. We take a moment for our own silent prayer at this time. In your life-giving name, we pray, Jesus. Amen. Would you please stand as we receive the blessing. <clears throat> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We go in peace now to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our final hymn, On Our Way Rejoicing, we sing number 537. Hey!